<clears throat> okay, um, what I'm going to run through um, today um, is really how you use uh, Flader Mouse for um, uh, for dealing with uh, with laser data or lidar data. Um, so I'm going to cover some of the different types of uh, data that we can bring in and what formats we support. Um, I'm going to originally just do a, a little bit on how you set up Quincy and what to um, look for and, and how it looks in real time, um, and then go into bringing data directly into Flader Mouse, making uh, Flader Mouse projects in, uh, in DMagic and the objects that we then use in Flader Mouse. Uh, a bit on uh, data cleaning, um, and because it's a little bit different to, to um, normal bathymetry data cleaning. And then some of the things about what you can do with the data once you've uh, once you've created, you know, done the cleaning and uh, producing the models. Um, so this is mobile laser mapping. So um, this is this is really predominantly about uh, the mobile laser scanners. But we also, and, and on a lot of the work we do, uh, and, and you, you bring together, you're trying to bring different types of sensors as well. So quite often you're going to have airborne. Uh, laser data as well, and also uh, there are also airborne bathymetric scanners that you can uh, use with Flader Mouse as well. So, uh, with mobile laser scanners, Quincy is um, um, interfaces, which is Quincy is the online software package at QPS, that interfaces to uh, to most of these systems. About probably in interfaces to more uh, laser scanners than any other software package for acquisition. Um, and the data format there is the, the QPD format, which is um, their um, XY, uh, Z uh, format, uh, internal format, which we use. Um, you can also get data in LAS format, which is quite popular in the, in the laser LiDAR world. Um, it also contains the intensity as well, which is always good to see. Uh, and then if you just have normal ASCII, XYZ plus uh, intensity, we can, we can handle that as well in a number of ways. Um, these are the laser scanners that uh, that are currently supported to to link into. Um, and this is uh, how it uh, it's sort of been. You know, new ones come up all the time, and it takes a bit of time for the drivers there. So so do check uh, what scanner you have um, before you, you you try and uh, interface it, just in case the, it's a new one and the driver hasn't been written yet. Uh, Bathy lidar systems. Uh, these are um, uh, doing the same thing, but use uh, use green laser to uh, to penetrate through the water, um, and uh, the Optech Shoal system, Frigo Lab system, and also the Ahab Hawkeye system. Uh, these all use Flader Mouse to a large degree to to process the data. So I won't be covering those, but just to let you know that, in fact, if you buy a Shoal system, you almost get I think you get uh, Flader Mouse with it for doing all the data processing. Uh, topo lidar systems. This is really we don't we're normally dealing with the data that comes from them. So again, we can we can take uh, point data and, and create digital terrain models using and that's LAS format and the ASCII format again, uh, or directly out of an ArcGIS database if you have that in there already. Um, and then also if it's already gridded data, already uh, digital terrain model, but in, a, in another format, we can take those uh, formats you see there at the bottom in. And, um, and, and geo-reference them and, and uh, create the 3D models. Uh, so in, in uh, speaking in, a, in, the, in the mobile laser and the uh, Quincy Flader Mouse flow, uh, you're starting off directly interface to the, to the scanner. Uh, the raw data is logged in a DB file within Quincy. Uh, and you can also create the QPD in real time, or you can post-process to create the QPD. And then that QPD is then brought into into Flader Mouse, and the bundle that you need in Flader Mouse to do this is uh, is FM Hydro. That's sort of could be called FM Topo sometimes with the uh, laser scanners, but uh, but that's the bundle at the moment because uh, that's the one that does the uh, data cleaning and uh, and things like that. Um, so a brief overview of Quincy. I'll show you the software in a second. Um, you treat it like a multi-beam system. The driver for it is actually found in the multi-beam uh, bathymetry driver um, subset. Um, and there's a couple of things that uh, the tips and tricks, and I'll just show you this rather than explaining it on a on a PowerPoint. Um, this is some of the displays from uh, from Quincy in real time. 
and there's this generic display here which uh, hopefully you'll be able to see um, and the main thing to look for is this uh, you want to set it up so you see the ping age because uh, if I start to uh, to replay this data here you can see you're getting data in the uh, in the raw display here but you're not getting any data in this display here and if you look at the ping time here the ping age is is, is very large so that's this is really important that means that the uh, the laser hasn't received its timing tag and you're not getting any data through so always have that running because sometimes you know they're outside you know there's boats moving you know, or the or the uh, uh, quad bytes moving so you might lose that so uh, so just check that uh, um, but you have your navigation display here which will create your real-time digital terrain model um, and then we these ones in here if I go to uh, uh, to one of the, uh, oops, wrong one, that one. If I go to this one here, it will uh, fire up my displays here. And then if I start logging again, and, uh, and this will take a, it only takes a little bit of time in replay just to kick in, but Here's the vessel um, with the breakwater ahead. Um, which is look, this is actually looking the same way as the, uh, the scanner's pointing. And um, we should be getting some data coming through in a moment. That might just be taking its time. There we go. So the, uh, this is the raw data display coming through. Uh, this is your um, corrected data for motion, position, well position but motion corrected data. Here you have your sound and grid display in real time uh, so you can see exactly where the laser scanner is uh, is pointing. It's picking up a few pieces over here but it's predominantly getting your breakwater in here um, and, and here we can zoom in so you can see where the, the laser scanner is picking up and then over here crucially you have your ping age and you, this is what you want to see. You don't want to be seeing seconds, you want microseconds or milliseconds. So uh, so that's how Quincy acquires the data, it logs this QBD file and the DB file. Uh, DB file is very raw so if you need to change any offsets or anything else you can change the offsets so nothing's lost um, and the QBD is what you actually use as, as a more efficient uh, file format and fully georeferenced. So that's a brief view of uh, Quincy just to uh, see where we're getting the data from. Now one of the things that uh, you can do for, for background as well is there's a number of uh, topo LiDAR gridded data sets um, and these ones uh, you can bring in very, very simply um, and an inflator mouse uh, you just import a a gridded data set, so gridded is already a, a regular spaced digital terrain model. Um, and if I just uh, go up to my laser webinar, this is an ArcView ASCII grid, um, and uh, and with this, we can uh, it already realizes what it is because it's seen it. Uh, we tell it what coordinate system the data is from, which is in this case in the UK. Got the bounds. We tell it what coordinate system we want it to be in, which we'll leave it as the UK National Grid. Um, it will then create an SD file, which is a, the fader mouse object we need to visualize. And uh, I'm just going to give it a color map. And uh, these are all my color maps you can add into here for some of them, my Topo one. And there is the DCM already uh, in the data set here. So very simple, very quick and easy to, to bring in. You have the object here and then we can use this uh, to sometimes it adds a bit of perspective to where we are. Um, normally for LiDAR it's always good to do a one-to-one -one exaggeration so we can just put one in here and um, then it looks a bit more lifelike. Uh, we can do 
uh, tools on the uh, geospatial processing tools on this data set, uh, things like um, computing the slope. Uh, which is quite important for, uh, for, for flood, flood modeling and things. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you can do surface differencing against other data sets. Uh, so you might have this as a baseline data set and have a laser scanner data set um, uh, on, that you collect, and then you can do a surface difference between this one and, and the laser one. So. Um, moving on now to slide, something that's a little bit more uh, complicated, and this is to take uh, laser data that you already have. Um, one of the real benefits of using Fladermouse is that you can bring in things like that digital terrain model that we just had. You can bring in um, imagery over the top, anything to help you uh, have an understanding of the data, to help you process it. We can you know, create the topo DTMs within the magic, uh, and then we create our PFM, uh, which is the spatial index on the hard drive structure that we have uh, within Flader Mouse and that gives us all our um, uh, ability to clean the data and to, uh, to extract uh, points and, uh, and surfaces for, from, from that data. So, um, so we'll be going to, into DMagic to do this um, and, um, and the first thing you do in DMagic is create a project. So I was going to call mine whatever we want and again select the coordinate system that you want your data to be in. Uh, I'm then going to import uh, some ungrid data, some point cloud data and this point cloud data is um, going to be uh, QPDs so you can bring in a directory of QPDs so I'll just do just going to look for QPD files, gonna add a directory, go to my desktop where I've got the data and in this folder here is my QPDs or are my QPDs so here they are I just have a quick check to make sure nothing else is in there and it's all fine the data it assumes but you have to check this is in the same coordinate system as your project um, and um, but it doesn't have to be this is whatever coordinate system your data is in and then we just do finish and it will scan through the data and it will just build up the lines as we go along. So this is our data set here. So these are the lines that we use to acquire, acquire that data. Now you don't really see much here, so we're going to add in uh, add in an image and. Um, and we have an image file in here. So it's a georeference TIFF image. And this is the bounds of that image. We haven't actually created any SD objects yet from this, so we can't actually see it. Uh, so what we do is we select our image over on the, on the left here, and then we convert image to SD, and just give it the same name as the, uh, as the TIFF. And there we have the georeferenced image. So now we can see that where the where the survey where the vessel was when it was doing some of these uh, survey lines. Uh, we also have some vector data. We have uh, a DXF file for the port, so we can uh, bring this uh, DXF file in. And again, it's just giving you the bounds for that where that DXF file lives. Uh, and we click, click on the bounds and we convert that vector data into here. So then we have the, the white outline there. We can change the color, make it a black outline for those ones. So, there you have. so that's the uh, some of the DXF for the data. Um, if we want to as well, we have uh, we can add in a. Um, I've got the topo lidar files here, so I can within here, select all these files, and it knows it's ASCII gridded data, we just tell it what coordinate system they're in, which is the same as the project. And this isn't going to create the SDs, it's just going to create, these are all uh, 500 meter or maybe a kilometer size uh, digital terrain models, 
and, uh, and we can select any one of these. It comes up down here. And, uh, and if we want to create a grid surface from it, we can just convert to grid in the same way as we just did in Play the Mouse. And, uh, and you just convert that in. So you're just building up as many different data sets as you can. Now, the one that I'm going to do here for this is to, I'm going to create a PFM in this area here. Uh, we have this breakwater that goes along here. There's, this is at low tide here. This photo was taken, so there's some, uh, a bit of a beach here. And this was, data was taken at low tide. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to select my area like this, which I want to create my PFM from. Um, and then I'm just going to build PFM from selected data. So it knows which QPDs fall within that region. Um, it knows that the coordinate system is uh, the UK national grid and the output is going to be the same, that's the project output. The bounds are what I just selected and the bin size here I'm going to say, and this is a little bit dependent upon what you want to do with the data. Um, if there's a big area you don't want to have a, a small bin size because it will create, it will take a long time to create the, uh, the PFM. Um, you can also take extract points and grid them at a higher resolution as well later on so you don't have to have this as a final resolution. Uh, I'm going to have this as a one meter resolution on this particular data set. Um, and I won't add any other attributes or any filters and, uh, and I'll just call this PFM PFM. So it extracts it creates a, a, a blank index and it adds in the data and then it loads the files up. So uh, this is one here. If you didn't expect any data to be outside the bounds that you had, if like, uh, then then this is saying that there was data that had been uh, was in the file but was outside the bounds of the PFM, so it won't be used. Um, and this is the total number of uh, accepted records in there. So. And again, you have all this down here in the project history, uh, where you create, every time you do anything, uh, it will tell you what, uh, what's been done with it. And if you click on any of these ones here, it comes up with the files that were in there, what the bounds were, the results, and all that. So you can, uh, it's a useful product, um, project history. Um, I'm going to change my color map here for, uh, for the PFM, because I don't particularly like that one. Um, and uh, I'll stick to the topographic color map here. And I'm just going to save that PFM to do it. So that's building the data up into uh, into this project. Um, and then I'm going to just I'm going to for the moment just deal with the with the PFM. So I can double click it, and um, and it brings up the uh, the PFM. Um, I can also, if I want to, uh, go to my SD folder, and I have all these other bits and pieces here, so I can bring in. I'll bring in the outline and the, and the aerial photo, so we have a bit of, uh, so we can see where things are for, for the moment. Uh, I'll turn off the aerial photo for a second. Um, and on the PFM here, uh, we have different surfaces, but one of the ones we're going to use here is the, uh, if I just make maximize this. Uh, normally we process on the shallow surface or the deep surface, because they're the ones with the spikes and then you have an average one in there as well. So I'll choose a shallow one and I'll extract the whole area because it's not very big. And uh, and you can see from here if I drop this down to one to one. Uh, and I'll also just turn off the uh, coverage map. Um, then you can see there's some spikes in the data. Uh, you've also got the breakwater here. Uh, and over here you've got a little bit of the uh, this, this, the beach area in that uh, in that top corner as well. Um, when you're in here and you can uh, select, you can either select in polygon mode, uh, or you uh, which is or select mode, which is this one. Or you go to polygon mode, uh, and you can go along like that. So just click on the same one before. And if I launch the 3D editor, this is now looking at the point data that was in that bounds. And on here, I have it colored by, by height, uh, by, by file rather. So each individual color is a, is a different, uh, different file. 
I can come into my area select mode here and I can take the data out. If it's covered on more than one line then it tends to be a feature. If it's only on one line then it doesn't. Let's turn off my rejected data so all I see is the accepted data. So that's taking you through. If you want to go into more de detail than this, uh, then you can go to the slice mode here, which is really useful if you've got uh, key walls and things like that. And this is also for breakwaters at times. You can uh, just step through this data set here. So you can see that you know this data in the middle here is you know is, is, is no good. Um, and uh, you're just clicking along, taking out the erroneous points. So you just end up with uh, with good points. And the power of the PFM is that as soon as you do file save on here, the area there automatically updates. So you see exactly what you've done when you want to do it. Um, if you do that along the data set um, and then you wish to extract the points from this, then one of the ways you can do it is if you just want to take the point data out of that area we just had, uh, you can use the tools option here uh, to export soundings. So a soundings in this case with a laser is, is just points. Um, and if you export the soundings, uh, you can just use it on the selected area that we had. Uh, you say it's only the accepted soundings that we want and um, and if you really wanted to fine-tune it then uh, say within the area we've got here uh, you say okay well I've finished editing this data this is this is fine uh, I'm then going to say okay well I just want to extract some of these ones here um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to set them as a feature flag so if I do a set feature here then they sort of get sub into another uh, type of uh, file so we can then we'll save and exit that area and now here we can export soundings from that selection accepted soundings only and I'm only going to oops, wrong one, I'm only going to export those ones which I've further flagged as feature records feature flag so when I output these I'll just call them feature then it will just extract those points uh, if I want to bring those points back in, and this is what if I, I can, one of the things that you quite often do is uh, if you want them to be uh, to be points back in here, you can actually reject all of them from the uh, from the PFM once you flag them as features, um, and then we can import our points, and there's our features uh, what we have here, and then we just say that they are in the same coordinate system, and you bring them in. Like this. Now they don't look particularly particularly clever at the moment. Uh, they are over here as a cube marker. Um, the best way of visualizing the points in photo mass is actually have them as a point. Um, that might seem obvious, but you can have them as a sphere, which means they are circular, and you can change the uh, uh, the size of the point radius here with the slider. If you want to get further in with the slider, you can just change the starting and ending values. So I'm just going to do one point is the ending value and just changes the range of the slider uh, so so the, these ones look kind of cool but they're a bit white so uh, we can either change color and, and color them something uh, something else like, uh, so, or if we want we can also color by point height um, and then you have to change the uh, change the color map So those are, this is now spheres that we're looking at. Again, we can change. But these also, if you have a lot of them, take a while to render because what we're looking at here is every single point here is having a shading rendered around it. And that, that can take a bit of time when you have a lot of points to render. Uh, and if you find you're having that, um, then if you change to point, um, then you can make them a bit bigger or smaller. Um, then you have something which is much much faster. So if I just I'm moving around here, and that's a, you know that's not degrading at all. If I change that to uh, to spheres again, start moving around, you can see there's a little bit of a delay in the data. So when you have it as point, it's much much quicker. And then you can also of course you know, 
increase the uh, the size of the points as well. So that was how to uh, to extract point data from the uh, uh, from here. You can also use that point data. Um, so if I decide actually I don't want to see points, but I want to grid at a higher resolution, so I can import ungridded data. I can select my feature, and then I can say, actually this is that national grid. This is this national grid. And I'm going to have uh, I'm going to have a 25 centimeter cell size. This is my bounds for that data, and uh, I'll use that color map. And then, oops, got to put a name on it. So I'm just going to call it feature.sd, and then that's my. So this is was done at uh, two meters. I think we said uh, with the PFM. This is now 25 centimeter resolution um, of that data. <clears throat> so the, the process is to take the data, clean out all of these spikes, um, and then either extract the data as points, um, which you can then uh, either visualize as points, or you can then regrid it. Uh, of course, if you take the whole um, data set that you've done, with the PFM, you can also unload these points back into the original QPDs, so you have clean QPDs, and from there you can do anything like this uh, in the in the same way. So, um, so that's the normal procedure is to clean the QPDs and unload, or clean the PFM and unload the QPDs. So that's data cleaning. There's a couple of things that um, now for sort of visualization. Uh, techniques and things. Um, I'll just cover the, uh, the points back on here. So when you build a laser PFM, the cell size is really dependent upon the final product. If you want um, digital terrain models out of it, it's good to have it at the same size as the, you know, like if you want a one meter DTM, then put it at one meter. But if you were doing, uh, you know, 20, 30 kilometers of coastline, then, uh, then you wouldn't want to do a one meter cell size because it will just uh, be too uh, take too long for the PFM to build. Um, you can add in like the intensity attribute just depends on the file format that you're bringing in. You can color a PFM by intensity as well, uh, but I'll show you that in a second. So in editing the PFM in Photomash, you clean out the bad returns. You select the soundings to export. You can then create surfaces. You can also import your uh, data just back in as uh, as points. Now, one of the questions we get quite a lot is dealing with vertical surfaces. Um, I'm not going to give away all the secrets here, but I shall show you uh, what you can do. The first thing you need to do is extract the points for the vertical surface. Now, using that feature flag before uh, to extract the points is, uh, is, is quite a nice way of uh, keeping just those uh, either on a wall or a you know, dock wall or a, uh, just any, any sort of uh, vertical place you want. Um, and the idea is that uh, let's fire a blade mouse for a moment. And bring it back here. So what we want to do is, uh, and I just need to drop this down to four cell size. So what this is showing you is these are points that are being extracted from the laser on the top of a key wall. These are the, the tires across the top and you've got the chain from the tire on the way down here. Um, and you can also see damage to the wall as well. Now to get your points from uh, from a PFM, you flag them as features, you export them as a wall, and these are in easting, northing and, uh, and depth, or height rather I should say. Um, to get them along to be a change here. So you can see on this change we're starting at zero here and we're finishing at uh, about 350 meter long uh, key wall here. So your x axis in this sense is the distance along the key wall. The y axis is actually your height and what you're gridding is how far away you are from a fictitious line that goes in the back of here. Now this to do that transformation, that that little bit of code isn't in Play the Mouse, um, but it's not that hard to write. Um, and um, and we've done. Uh, uh, you can just do it. It's, it's, 
there, there, are, there are a couple of utilities that um, some of the, uh, the, the do it, but it's, it takes a long period of time. So all you're doing is basically comparing a Easting and Northing and Z to a, a line in Easting and Northing and Z and working how far off it is and how far along it is and giving it those attributes instead. So, uh, uh, so sorry, I'm not giving away loads of secrets here, but that's how you do it. Um, and a bit of Visual Basic programming will uh, get you there. Uh, so, and when it's in this um, format here, when you have it as an SD, you can do all the surface difference calculations on it. Uh, you can look at damage, you can report things, you can uh, image things. But then, at the moment, you're just having one wall at a time like this. What you really want to do is be able to combine these all. Um, so when you have a DTM in Flatermass, regardless of which DTM it is, uh, you can always uh, export the surface as an image. Now, when you export the surfaces of the image here, there's no real georeferencing, um, but you know from your point data what the start coordinate was here and what the end coordinate was here. And even if it goes around the corner, you can you can know what your x, y, and z is along the along this area here. So we can use the vertical image in the Flader Mouse. Uh, so if I clear this scene here and uh, and bring in the the final finished product, if you like. Um, then this is with bathymetry as well, and what we have here is um, we have the laser here. Now you see here we have. Let me just move that up. This is now a vertical curtain and a vertical image, and has a start point, it has an end point, and it has a depth range. So what you're looking at here, you can't profile in here anymore uh, because we're now just looking at an image. But you do see where it is in relation to everything else in a 3D scene. So that's one of the, you know, and then if you have um, aerial photography and things like this, then you can, you can, you can bring all that information in as well. Um, and it's really useful for uh, civil engineering purposes uh, for, for doing things. Um, one of the other things which is also is now getting onto more of the tips and tricks, if you like, um, <clears throat> is when you're dealing with a with the points, there's no, what doesn't look particularly good on the points, if I zoom in, so this is again laser data on the top and uh, back of the data is the, uh, the, the the yellow point cloud and a digital terrain model from the, from the seabed around this uh, this LNG terminal. And then when you zoom in, you see the points, uh, and you also see through to the to the other side from from within here, um, which isn't uh, which isn't particularly uh, well. It's okay, but it's but you can do better as such uh, on it. So because you don't want to, you want to stop seeing through the points to the other side. Now, there are a number of things here which uh, which we have which aren't used very often, but uh, this is quite a useful one to do, um, and that we can add a shape into here. So I can add it, and I can add a cylinder shape in here, and um, and this is our big cylinder shape, and um, and we can move our cylinder shape to somewhere over where we want, um, and we can also change the dimensions of the shape so we can get it a bit uh, a bit closer. So if I zoom in here a moment, um, and you can expand the, the shape a bit as well. If I uh, let's go up to the top here. trying to see where my shape has gone on here. But luckily I've got one which I created earlier, which is uh, this cylinder here. Um, and when you look at the one I created earlier, just, uh, you can see it now from the other side is black, so you can't see through to, uh, to where it is. And, and when you look at it down here now, you're stopping the points being included on the, on the way through so that you don't actually uh, see through to the other side. Now, if you've got a few of these to do, then once you've saved one down, uh, then you can always um, bring it back up again. And on the second one, uh, you can just go, okay, well, I need this one now to be over this way. And you can just bring it down, move it in, and, uh, and rescale it to, uh, to fit within the pile. And you just continue doing that uh, for all of them. I say, I mean, if you had thousands, it would take, it wouldn't be so good. But uh, this is quite an easy way of uh, putting 
a feature from the software in amongst the points inside it so you don't see through to the other side and, um, and that creates quite a, um, a good uh, visualization way of doing things. <coughs> Um, the other thing is um, one of the best ways of visualizing the points in Play the Mouse for, for a presentation, especially if you have a lot of them, is actually to make a movie. I, won't, I mean, there have been a lot of movie-making uh, webinars um, done before, but uh, you fly a, fly a flight path that you want for your movie, and then basically you render the movie. Uh, the advantage with that is you're rendering at full point density all the way through, uh, whereas here you're waiting for the scene to, to catch up depending on the graphics card that you have. Um, and then another example um, is uh, over here if I do this one. This is where we've taken some of the points, made a digital terrain model, and this is actually colored now by the intensity of the, dis of the display. So, uh, so we have colored by height and then colored by intensity. So all that's doing is shading and then you're shading by the next attribute which is, uh, so this is a regular DTM and each regular, so this is a regularly gridded intensity as well, so it's a, it's a scalar. Um, and then we just brought the rest of the data in as, uh, as points. Uh, we can also bring in uh, land contours or anything else we want so we can do surface difference calculations based on the DTM and, or, and show the difference contours and a few other things like that. So you just bring in as many different uh, types of data as you can to show you where you're doing it. Um, and then the last one here is, uh, is just an example of combining data different types of data. So this is actually a, a digital terrain model of a cliff which is being gridded, normally gridded actually, so it's not as, um, uh, if I did one on one on here you can see it's not as steep as uh, it, it might be, so you're not having so many issues. We are having a few issues with uh, gridding vertically but not, uh, not too many. Uh, and then I've extracted some of the data as points around the, uh, around the beach part here and then there's also uh, just the distribution of points uh, up here, just uh, you know, on the Coast Guard station up here. So, uh, so it's just different. Uh, and again, we're integrating. These are different resolutions. Uh, the cliff is uh, half a meter cell size. The bathymetry is one meter cell size. We're not resampling or anything here. We're keeping it individually at its own cell size, and um, and, and bringing them in. So, uh, to do the the one thing I'm really showing is. Well, like when you're doing the scalar side of things, things uh, if you have X, Y, Z data, oh, and I want to bring some in, you have this, uh, this is the original data for some of the area, uh, and uh, oh, I'm going to do it the other way, sorry, uh, input ungraded data, it's ungraded, and this is actually um, intensity, then easting, then northing, then height. So when you look at here, you've got four different numeric fields, and we can say, okay, we well, don't want to for the for the digital terrain model with Z. I only want I want the X value to be my easting, the Y value to be my northing, and my Z value to be the one I want to grid. If I wanted to do it as a scalar, then uh, which is easting, northing, and intensity, then X, Y, and Z. So you you the value to grid is actually the, the, the scalar. And then you create a surface from one of these, so that's a DTM, an SD file. You create a scalar from this one, and then you impose one on top of the, uh, to the other. So, again, just to recap on that, combining all the data in Fledermass is that's where you know the unique factor of Fader Mouse comes in. Um, all these different formats that you can uh, bring in, so you have a package that can process data and visualize it all in the same one, and bring in lots of different data sets as well. Um, and the and the goal is always if you have a 
lots of different data sets and you know download some from the internet or whatever then you know as, all, as many as you can will give you a better job in being able to analyze the data you have and, and get more out of it um, point cloud data is always more realistic if the points are occluded so if the points behind the ones in front are, are, are invisible uh, and that's where we put in these um, cylinders or if you have a square object there's a square or a circle there's a few shapes you can put in uh, if you save that um, object down and then bring it back up again you can do it multiple times and then that will save you time if you have say like the piles you have a lot of piles to do um, color and surfaces by intensity or even the point cloud by intensity is also uh, very useful to see what uh, what's different in the data set uh, and again Remember, we have the uh, the link. Uh, remember to use 32-bit photomass because the Arc um, uh, link is, uh, is the Esri engine is only in 32-bit mode. Uh, so when you want to do this, use the 32-bit bit of photomass. But you can take any of the data sets that we just created, the points, the surfaces, um, and then you can push them straight into an Arc to your database uh, directly from within photomass. Um, so it's a direct to, and you can also pull data back out. So you might have LiDAR data already stored in an ArcGIS database that you want to bring in as points into Flatermouse. You can do that, uh, as well as the surfaces and everything else that's around it. Um, so that's the, the link. So we've been doing Quincy to acquire the data from the mobile laser scanner. Say so it supports more than anything else. Uh, we clean the data in Flatermouse. We extract the data to be used in the visualization. Um, and analysis and then to either store the data for uh, archive and, and uh, temporal study uh, or to actually uh, then bring the data, more data, different types of data back in, published to the cloud is where the ArcGIS comes in. So the link between the three packages um, here is, uh, is, is, is very neat, very fast and, uh, and works very well. And if you want any more help with this, you can always, you always get hold of me. Um, I'm actually put my email on there, which is probably a good thing, but it's uh, malice at qps.nl. Um, and uh, Katrina here in the, in the office um, in the UK, she's the product specialist on, uh, for Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and, and Erin, of course, over in the, over in the Americas. So, uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for listening, and um, any, any questions? It's now a good, good time. Hey Duncan, that was fantastic. Um, I have one question so far, so if anybody else has questions while Duncan works on this one, please uh, either raise your hand or type them in for me. Um, Duncan, this was when you were looking at the Alexander key. Um, mm -hmm. Someone asks, is there an option to extract automatically cross sections um, and then have them in CAD format? And I know that we don't really do CAD format well, but you might be able to address doing profiles on that surface. Yeah, if you if you have it in as the um, as the as the distance along, yeah, you have it in as the surface, um, then you can take uh, the easiest way of doing it is to to make two uh, D CAD files of change and and depth, if you like, or change and height uh, to be the same way. Um, drape, and then you can drape them onto that surface. That surface was a five, I think, two centimeter for the laser, actually. Um, so then you can extract it whatever distance long you want um, from that. Uh, so you, that's a 2D DXF being made into a 3D DXF, and then you can make it. You know, you can save it back as a DWG file to to bring into uh, to CAD. So uh, that, that's a, um, the easiest way of doing that. Um, the other, the only other way of doing it really is well. I mean, so if they want the points out of it in a cross profile, then the best way to do that is in the 3D editor in the slice mode. And you set your slice up to be the distance along that you want, and then just extract the points and each time and, and do it that way. But you wouldn't want to do that for a whole keyboard. That's just no, that's a bit too long. Okay, great. That was a good answer. Um, no yeah. other questions uh, so far. Just. Um, people telling you you did a good job. So I guess um, we will mm -hmm. just round it up. Um, if anybody does have a question and um, we didn't you think of it afterwards, please just email me and I'll get it to Duncan um, or whoever can answer the question. So I, we do a pretty good job of following up. Um, thanks again, Duncan. That was really good. I will. We did record it, I hope. It looked like it was having issues, but um, I'm going to check it when we get off here. So that will be available for you guys to download um, if you want to watch it later. All right. Thanks, Duncan. Thank you very much. And thank you thanks all for, for coming. Thanks for listening, and we'll hopefully see you again next time.
All right. Bye-bye.